uh, let's get started. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Lynn Gordon. I lead the advertising and marketing practice here at Venable. I'm joined by my partner, Shaheen Rothermel. We're going to give you an update today on the legal and regulatory environment surrounding green or environmental advertising claims. This is an area that is incredibly dynamic. It changes daily. We were making updates to the uh, presentation you know, 20 minutes ago because some new cases have been filed. So thank you for joining us today. I think you'll find it uh, interesting and informative and let's get started. Can I get the next slide, please? So we'll talk about the green, about green claims generally. We'll talk about the FTC's green guides, how it approaches uh, green claims. We'll talk about the National Advertising Division of the BBB, which has been very active on uh, green claims and very aggressive in some of the positions that it takes. We'll also talk about the plaintiff's class action bar, which is very, very active on green claims. We'll talk about uh, state laws that impact green claims, including efforts by various state attorneys general to uh, police that area. And we'll wrap up by talking about things that companies can do to reduce their risk profile um, for this very active area. And I'll turn it over to Shaheen to give you all a little bit of background regarding green claims. Thank you, Len. Green advertising is very broadly defined. It's any communication or advertising that states or implies that a product or a business has a positive impact on the environment, has no detrimental impact on the environment, is less damaging to the environment than other products or businesses, or has uh, improved their impact, their environmental impact over time. Those claims, just like any type of advertising claim, can be conveyed through text, it can be conveyed through images, logos, labels, certifications, anything that states or implies uh, that any of these messages. So we see a lot of this with respect to things like trees, the use of green and blue, and the chasing arrows here that you see or the Mobius loop uh, with respect to uh, recycled and recyclable claims. Here's some general principles with respect to environmental green advertising. The first one is pretty standard in the advertising law context. Don't mislead consumers. Make sure that you have substantiation for all the claims you make, whether or not those are express claims or implied claims. The intent behind your statement or your advertisement doesn't matter. So it's not the claim that you intend to make. The only thing that matters is the reasonable interpretation of the consumer, interpretation by reasonable consumers, and that's what you need to substantiate. In the context of green advertising, there are special rules for specific terms like eco, green, sustainable. And then in some instances, there are prohibited terms. For example, California has a regulation concerning biodegradable. That is basically a ban on biodegradable claims unless you meet very, very stringent requirements. The substantiation standard for green claims is it follows the basic principles that we talk about when we're looking at advertising claims generally. The same standards apply. That means you need to have substantiation before you make the green claim. If an advertisement lends itself to more than one reasonable interpretation, you have to have substantiation for each reasonable interpretation, not just the claim that you intended to make. You need to have a reasonable basis for any verifiable green claim, whether or not that's expressed or implied. We'll talk about the FTC's green guides and court interpretations and the NAD in a little bit, but in a lot of instances, this requires competent and reliable evidence to support some of your claims. Green claims in particular need to be based on the full life cycle of the product and the constituents. Unless in your advertisement you are clearly stating otherwise and making explicitly clear what the claim and what the benefit is. A lot of times we have seen challenges to environmental claims where someone will say that a claim about environmental benefits can still be misleading if there are other environmental harms. And that's what makes um, this, this very important is having information about the full life cycle of the product to ensure that it's not, you're, you're not making a claim that might be expressly true, but uh, it overstates the benefit that you might have. Make information um, you know, clearly and conspicuously 
disclose what you need. Make information that you can't easily fit into an ad easily available to consumers. I consider this the educational approach to environmental advertising. You'll see this throughout our presentation, but one thing that really underpins it is that environmental advertising in the United States is very confusing. Number one, because reasonable, um, reasonable consumer, consumers' interpretation is sort of all over the place. And number two, because the ability of our infrastructure in the United States on the national and regional loca local levels is very difficult to substantiate benefits because there's not that infrastructure there to actually provide things like recyclability and other types of end-of-life treatment. And for that reason, we recommend having, that, um, having the information available to consumers and educating consumers about what you mean when you're talking about environmental claims. Glenn, do you want to talk about the FTC's green guides and call for comment? Happy to do that. So there is no special federal law for purposes of green or eco-based advertising. The FTC enforces uh, Section 5 of the FTC Act, its general uh, advertising statute, which prohibits unfair deceptive acts or practices. So in looking at green claim, green claims, you were talking about Section 5 of the FTC Act. The FTC has uh, tried to explain to people how these types of claims intersect with Section 5 of the FTC Act through the green guides. And we'll cover it a little bit. They've gone through several iterations, but um, there's some general principles from the green guides that we probably start with. The green guides, at least as currently constituted, they're in the process of being reviewed. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Are, are I would say hostile to general terms like eco-friendly, green, or earth smart. They think they're per se deceptive. They want specific or qualified claims rather than broad general claims. And one of the important things I think to remember as we're thinking about the FTC's approach versus perhaps private plaintiffs, and the NAD follows the um, the FTC's approach. Under FTC law, you have to have substantiation for your claim before you make it and for all reasonable interpretations of your claim. In most instance, instances, when a private plaintiff, even a public interest a, you know, plaintiff is making a challenge under some state statute, they have to actually prove that the claim is false. And so the difference between a, a broad echo claim that something is echo friendly, it would be really hard perhaps to prove that that's fully substantiated when you consider the full life cycle of the product. But it's also hard to prove it's false, um, or it's harder to prove it's false. So as you, as you see, there's some inconsistencies in the, the case law that we'll talk about today and the approaches that we'll talk about today. And I think a lot of that inconsistency is driven by the difference in approach. You know, the FTC has the luxury of having built up case law that says you have to have substantiation for any reasonable interpretation of a claim beforehand. Under state law, you generally have to prove that it's false. Um, Back to first principles with the green guides, claims need to make clear whether you're talking about the entire product, part of the product, the packaging. Again, broad claims are are, are viewed with hostility. Uh, compostable claims, again, um, things will break down in a safe and timely manner in home or municipal compost files, but not if it's only the case in certain municipal uh, facilities. And this is sort of similar to the approach that the green guides take on recyclability. They are essentially charging the person who's making the claim with understanding how the product is likely to be disposed of and explaining that to consumers. Um, so let me go to the next slide, Shaheen. Thanks. So th these are the green guides. That's what they look like in the Federal Register. Um, this is the FTC's interpretation of the law. It is not the law. So if you um, were to be sued by the FTC, you know, you can argue to a judge or to the FTC that that interpretation is wrong. If you're arguing in front of the administrative law judge or the commission itself, you're going to have a hard time convincing them that they're wrong. A judge, you know, may be a little more skeptical about some of this. The green guides were first issued in 1992. They were revised in 2012. They are under revision now. The FTC has sought comments. They've held workshops. They, um, but the guides have not yet been finalized. Most people think that will happen in the early part of next year. We'll see. Um, the FTC has a lot going on on the rulemaking front, on the uh, guidance front. 
uh, uh, certainly they're cognizant that there's an election at the end of next year. So there's going to be a lot of push to get things out. I do think the Green Guides will be something that does get out next year, but um, no guarantees. We go to the next page. Okay. So as currently constituted, and I think as you can reasonably expect going forward, broad claims really do need to be qualified under the Green Guides. If you're making a green claim, you have to talk about the specific attribute of the product to which you're referring. There's got to be clear and prominent qualifying language. If a claim bottle uses 25% less plastic than before, this is you know, an example that they approve of. Eco-friendly packaging, they don't. Um, recycling claims, um, and we'll talk about this a lot because if, if you look at the cases that the FTC has brought, and um, a lot of them have been focused on recyclability. Um, and what's interesting is the way the FTC approaches this is they, they really hold the um, marketer responsible for um, the, the availability or not of recycling facilities in, in uh, an area. So they've got to be, uh, the, the marketer has to avoid deceiving people on the availability of recycling programs for consumers. So if you're selling things nationwide and there's a great disparity in the availability of recycling programs, that's quite a challenge. Um, you have to avoid making misleading claims that your product is, you've somehow increased the recyclability of your product. It's, it's now more recyclable than before, especially if, if the difference is minuscule. Uh, they talk about a 1% to 1.5% um, increase. That's not really... Uh, Material, uh, when a product, when you're making a claim that your product is made of recyclable materials, um, you can't make that claim if your product is shaped or has some other attribute that um, it can't actually be recycled. Um, and you've got to be truthful when you're talking about the amount of recycled content that is in, in your product. Um, you know, broad claims that, you know, made of recycled content with no um, qualifier or no specificity are going to be problematic, especially if the amount of recycled content that is in your product is low. We go to the next side. So the one of the big areas um, in echo advertising and really in the whole green uh, debate and the green advertising debate are carbon offsets and claims related to uh, climate change. The existing green guides talk about uh, claims related to uh, environmental benefits tied to carbon offsets have to be cognizable within two years, and you need to have competent and reliable scientific evidence. So if you're claiming that you know, you're carbon neutral, you've got to have studies that show that your uh, carbon footprint is you can scientifically, you can show that the carbon offsets and other things that you do to reduce your carbon footprint or to mitigate your carbon footprint, uh, render it to be net zero or, or, or zero. And that is the way a lot of companies that are making claims about uh, reducing their carbon footprint or, uh, you know, carbon neutral, low carbon, carbon negative. But most of those claims are, are tied to carbon offsets. There is a uh, market reality uh, on the horizon where those carbon offsets are getting harder to obtain um, and the efficacy, the, the, the carbon mitigating efficacy of some of the offsets or some of the things that are used for offsets um, are being challenged and, and they're how much good they actually do are, are being scrutinized. So I think this is going to be an area where you'll, you'll see uh, a, a lot of activity, not just in, in advertising, but uh, as a society and trying to figure out how much credit we're going to give people for doing these types of things. I think it's really uh, to be determined. Um, so th these are things that the FCC is asking about as we talk about um, the, the topics here in their potential, in the revisions to the, to the green guides. They're asking what evidence is there of deceptive claims related to climate change in the marketplace. They're asking what guidance they ought to be giving to help provide marketers avoid such claims. They're asking what uh, 
consumer research is available regarding uh, these types of claims, you know, net zero, carbon neutral, low carbon, or carbon negative. What claims are prevalent? In prior iterations of the green guides, the FTC actually did some of their own copy testing to uh, learn how consumers interpreted uh, certain language, certain phrases, certain marketing terms like recyclability, recyclable, made of recycled content. It's unclear, at least to me, if they're actually doing their own research this time or just calling for um, publicly available research to be submitted to the agency as part of their um, request for comments on the revisions to the green guides. But um, you know, historically, they had done you know their own copy testing to inform the guides. It's at least so far to me unclear whether they're doing it this time. I, I would hope they would. Um, as we'll go through the presentation, you'll see that people view these things uh, differently as to you know what kind of a, what claims are uh, impermissibly broad uh, echo benefit claims, and which someone else says that's ah, just puffery. It, it's it's meaningless and permissible. So, uh, you know, a lot of this is in the eye of the beholder, and that's why having copy tests to sort of figure out how a reasonable consumer might view these kinds of claims is actually very, very important. Uh, and companies who are facing uh, litigation in this front, you know, I think you will see them doing a lot of uh, copy testing to, to see how, how much skepticism consumers uh, place on these kinds of claims. With that, let me turn it over to Shaheen, who's going to talk some more about recycled content claims. Thanks, Lon. The current guides have uh, guidance surrounding recycled content claims. It, the FTC says that a recycled content claim is appropriate only for materials that are recovered or diverted uh, from the solid waste stream, either during the manufacturing process or after consumer use. So pre-consumer recycled content or post-consumer recycled content. And the FTC says that if the source of that recycled content is pre-consumer material, you need to have evidence to show that it would have otherwise entered the waste stream. In other words, if you're using recycled content as within your, your product, you have to have evidence that you've actually diverted that content uh, from the waste stream as opposed to it going somewhere else that would have the same environmental benefit as this. The FTC has... Uh, identified or acknowledged the pain point with a lot of these claims is if you want to have a qualified recycled content claim, a lot of times that qualification requires some analysis and calculation of that input. And so what we have is the industry asking, well, how do I substantiate recycled content claims? Do I use per product or annual weighted average calculation methods? And so the FTC has uh, asked whether or not the guides should be revised uh, to provide more information about how you as an advertiser can make these claims. Uh, are there alternative methods that you can use when you're calculating that recycled content within the product? Uh, product? Um, mass balance calculations or certificate like credit or tagging systems or other methods. And if you look at the comments, and I'll say that I think there were nearly 1,400 comments that were submitted in response to the call for comments this round. A lot of commenters have suggested allowing third-party certifications to substantiate qualified recycled content claims. And uh, certifications themselves come with their own issues that Len will talk about in a little bit. But the FTC, we're, you know, we're, we're waiting to see what the FTC will say about the use of these types of certification and certification bodies to allow for the calculation of these, these, um, these recycled content and other similar qualified or quantitative uh, environmental advertising claims. Again, the FTC is asking for information about how people interpret the claims. And you'll see again throughout that we haven't seen a lot of consumer perception evidence on the recycled content claim. What I would be interested to see is as these claims and cases start working them way, their way through the courts in particular, um, as well as National Advertising Division cases, is whether or not we're going to start seeing consumer perception survey evidence about how consumers interpret these types of claims. Because in a lot of respects, things like this, recycled content claims, they're very technical. I mean, what do consumers understand mass balance calculations? Um, do they understand annual weighted average? So 
so it's it's an open question that I think needs to be settled so that we have some true guidance, meaningful guidance in the industry for this. Another area that the FTC has requested comments on is energy use and energy efficiency claims. And this is a big one. The FTC is asking whether or not it should add guidance on energy use or en energy efficiency claims for home-related products, e electric uh, vehicles, or other products. And we've seen some cases by the FTC in the past where it's looked at energy savings claims in the context of up to claims. And, um, you know, if it, if it does expand, this will, this will expand into a lot of different home consumer good areas, things like solar panels, maybe things like insulation materials, um, you know, various HVAC units. So this could, this could open up the green guides to even more industry regulation in that regard. Uh, the FTC has asked whether there are uh, types of products in, that are typically involved with deceptive, uh, deceptive claims. I don't know that commenta commenters really responded to that, but it will be interesting to see if the FTC in the updated guides actually identifies um, specific industries or perhaps specific sales channels, for example, where you're using um, third-party independent contractors or salespeople who are going out and promoting these products, whether or not that's going to be something that the FTC talks about in the updated guides. The FTC's current guides uh, do not address sustainable claims, and this is a huge area of advertising. Um, and the, in, in 2012, which is over a decade ago now, the FTC said that for sustainable claims, the commission lacks sufficient evidence on which to base general guidance. And I would say that that was pretty honest of the FTC to acknowledge that because it, it's true, I think, even now today, the question of what consumer perception there is surrounding this is definitely something that is that is up in the air. And we've seen um, commenters talk, you know, submitting to the FTC responses saying that the FTC should clarify for words like sustainable as well as these other words like degradable, ozone-friendly, organic, compostable, um, asking the FTC to clarify what type of evidence really is sufficient to support these claims. And one thing in particular is, uh, or a couple things are um, the age of the research or studies. As Len mentioned a little bit ago, the question of what facilities we have and what uh, ability people actually have here in the United States to take advantage of the environmental benefits of products. Um, you might have studies that are 10 years old or even five years old that might be outdated with respect to a specific environmental attribute, um, end of life treatment um, in certain uh, municipalities or regions or even nationwide. So asking for clarification from the FTC about how recent does your, does your science need to be to support these claims? Do these claims uh, need to be supported by data that's on a regional basis, national basis? And if so, um, you know, how and how do the claims, how should the claims be made? So hopefully we'll get some more clarification from the FTC on those types of, types of issues. As part of what, when the FTC, whenever it has, um, you know, comment period, a lot of times what it will do is hold workshops. Although uh, Sam Levine said they don't hold workshops just for the sake of holding workshops, but I think this was a good one. It had an open meeting concerning recyclable claims uh, back in May of this year, and it had a number of topics that it looked at, including the current state of recycling practices and recycling-related advertising in the U.S., consumer perception again of recycling-related claims, and the need for any updates or other changes to the Green Guides related to those claims. And one of the issues that was addressed in that workshop was the availability of recycling facilities for appropriate end-of-life treatment and the claims that could be made. So if you had, we, we'll talk a little bit about a case, uh, a case that was decided by a court, a question about whether or not if I make a recyclable claim for a plastic bottle, and I sell that bottle on a nationwide basis. Um, the FTC currently says that a recyclable claim, uh, you need to have a substantial majority of the population where that bottle is sold must have access to that end of life treatment such that that bottle is actually recycled. So not only is it recyclable, but that claim also means that a substantial majority of consumers actually are able to recycle it. So in a lot of ways, the FTC has put the onus on the advertisers to do the research and make sure that before they're making claims about recyclable, that there are there is an ability in the target market for that 
product to actually be recycled, which I think creates a real sticky wicket for advertisers in a lot of ways. Because, you know, on the one hand, you want to create a product that has this environmental attribute. And so you might spend more on the constituents of the product and you want to be able to promote that. You want to be able to tout that. But then you're constrained by the municipalities or the infrastructure and the ability of that of those those places to actually recycle the product. And so um, the FTC has sort of tied people's hands in ways uh, on the on the recyclable claims. But we'll see we'll see what the FTC says about about that now in the updated guides. And with that, Len, do you want to talk about green seals? Sure. So one of the areas where the FTC has been active in enforcement, um, both bringing actual cases and um, warning letters are on the use of green seals. Uh, the example you see on the screen is actually from the, the green guides. And if you're going to use a seal, a um, couple of things. First off, it's gotta be a real, real third party um, certification process. You can't create your own seal uh, and imply that some third party has verified the bona fides of your uh, greenness or, or you, you know the, the eco friendliness of your product, and if you're using the seal, you've got to um, explain you know what it was that has been certified. That you know here it's biodegradable, recyclable, compostable. You know it's not just talking about all of the green attributes of your product. You know energy consumption, carbon output, things like that. It, the, the certification, just like a claim, which it is a claim essentially, has to be limited to that which has actually been uh, studied and certified by the certification and entity. And I think it was 2015, the FTC sent out a wave of warning letters to companies that were uh, in the FTC's eyes deceptively using uh, seals to uh, inflate the eco-friendly nature of their products or to confuse consumers about the testing uh, that had been done to substantiate those kinds of claims. So um, just, you know, and the, the use of a seal is essentially an endorsement. So you bring in all of the uh, FTC jurisprudence on, you know, endorsements and testimonials, and there is now a rule about, you know, fake endorsements. So if you've actually now created a fake seal, um, before it was, you know, something not nice to do. Now you, it is a rule violation uh, with a 54,000 a pop uh, civil penalty. So the, the stakes for doing that kind of thing have, have increased significantly. And let me turn it over to Shaheen now to talk about an entity that's been very active in the green space, the uh, National Advertising Division. That's right. The National Advertising Division of BBB National Programs, as a refresher, is a non-governmental dispute resolution body. It adjudicates questions and disputes related to advertising claims, and it has seen an uptick in environmental advertising claims. One notable case here is the American Beverage Association. The ABA had a, a campaign that the Every Bottle Back initiative. So you can see here an example of, of one of the ads, which was America's leading beverage companies unite to reduce new plastic use and increase collection of their valuable bottles through the Every Bottle Back initiative. And that was designed to reduce the U.S. Uh, beverage industry's use of virgin plastic and in, instead increase the use of recycled PET beverage containers and increase PET recycling. So you get that feedback loop of those bottles. And some additional claims that the American Beverage Association made was, we're carefully designing our bottles to be 100% recyclable, including the caps. They're collected and separated from other plastics so they can be turned back into materials that we use to make new bottles, increasing awareness about the value of our 100% recyclable plastic bottles, completes the circle and reduce plastic waste, and working with third parties uh, to reduce the plastic footprint. NAD looked at the claims and it found a number, it found that um, the ABA had a reasonable basis for a number of the claims, including our bottles are made to be remade and we're carefully designing our bottles uh, to be 100% recyclable, including the caps. And the uh, NAD noted that 
they had submitted, the advertiser had submitted evidence that its member companies used 100% recyclable virgin plastic PET. And it was even, they were even transitioning from dark to clear plastic to make their bottles even more recyclable. Um, so uh, it also noted that while the ABA had supported its recycling claims, the claim also referred to the use of recycled material that, quote, reduces plastic waste. And it provided um, evidence about the efforts to reduce total waste in the manufacturing process. But the evidence was less clear about the actual reduction in plastic waste and whether that was a me meaningful reduction. So the NAD really parsed this out and, and said, okay, well, you've made a number of aspirational claims about what we're doing. We're designing our bottles to be 100% recyclable. Our bottles are made to be remade. So NAD looked at those um, aspirational claims and said people will understand that those are aspirational. That doesn't necessarily mean that you've achieved that goal immediately. But then it also said that to the extent that you make claims that implied that there was some sort of benefit that has already been achieved or is currently being achieved, you need to actually have um, evidence demonstrating that meaningful reduction in plastic waste here. So the American Beverage Association uh, appealed NAD's decision uh, to the NARB, the appellate body of the National Advertising Division. And the NARB said that the claims convey to reasonable consumers that a significant amount of recycled content currently is used by the industry to produce new single-use plastic bottles and that there is a resulting reduction in plastic waste today. So NARB found that the use of the phrasing, so they can be turned back into material that we use to make new bottles, along with visuals of new bottles on a conveyor belt, communicated a message that a significant amount of the recycling into new bottles is currently occurring. So again, that question of whether or not you've got an aspirational claim or a claim that implies that something is currently occurring. And NARB looked not only at the text, but also the images of new bottles. So this concept of you had a bottle that was then becoming remade into a new bottle currently and said, that communicates that idea that it is currently occurring, that a significant amount of recycling in a new bottles is currently um, uh, occurring. And the NARB said that the advertiser failed to provide evidence of a significant use by industry members of recycled plastic to produce new bottles or any evidence that the current use of recycled plastic reduces plastic waste. So again, being very nitpicky there and parsing those uh, aspirational claims versus the current claims. And NARB also noticed that while the ABA had maybe intended simply to explain the potential for the bottles to be recycled, the advertisement went beyond that. So the ad surpassed that intended message and conflated current recycling practices and outcomes with aspirational practices and outcomes. And it, uh, NARB recommended that the advertiser provide uh, further clarification, so more qualification, more disclosures, more education, to ensure that the claims conveyed only the message that the advertiser intended, which is the connection between how the recycling by consumers of the bottles could help the industry meet those aspirational goals. Um, and so tying those together and saying that those could lead to a measurable reduction and not implying the broader message that the measurable reduction had already um, had already uh, occurred. And this is an important case because we see a lot of companies and organizations wanting to tout the aspiration and the future looking goals of their advertising. Because a lot of times the measures that we take today might not necessarily pay off tomorrow or next month, but they take a little bit longer. There's a bit of a horizon needed to reduce your environmental impact. So we see claims that say we're trying to do something by 2021, by 2025, by 2030, by 2050, whatever it might be. But you need to be very careful when you're making those claims to distinguish between the claims that might be aspirational versus the ones that are yielding a current benefit. I'm going to pause for one second for the CLE code. The CLE code is green 2023. Again, that is green 2023. NAD has a couple of other um, uh, general principles here that, that we put here. Um, to the extent that an advertiser makes a claim concerning sustainability, uh, NAD considers the relevant scientific evidence and consumers' understanding and expectation to ensure that the advertising is truthful and misleading. In other words, if you want to make a claim about sustainability or animal welfare, for example, if you're um, in the animal um, food space, uh, then you need to have competent, reliable scientific evidence. 
Uh, again, that aspirational claim uh, issue, when aspirational claims are tied to measurable outcomes, you need to be able to demonstrate that those aspirations are not merely illusory. You have to provide evidence that you're actually taking steps to reach the stated goal. So I can't say, it's. I, I think about this a lot like in the weight loss context, you know, I want to lose 20 pounds by next month. I mean, that's very aspirational, but if I'm eating a million calories today and not doing any exercise, then of course I can say it, but there's no substantiation, really no, no world in which that, that's going to be achieved. And that's the concept here behind this. The, the NAD also says that if you are in a nascent stage and your efforts are, are at that very initial stage, then you need to make that, make that clear um, where you are. And if you're making an aspirational claim, it needs to be realistic. So a lot of the points, yeah, a lot of the points that Shaheen just mentioned really uh, coalesce in a, a challenge that was brought against JBS. JBS is the world's largest meat packer. They own Tyson chicken. They own an enormous amount of the meat processing in the United States and throughout the world. And they started a, a net zero by 2040 campaign, um, you know, bacon, chicken wings and steak with net zero emissions. It's possible. Leading change across the food industry and achieving our goals of net zero by 2040 will be a challenge. Anything less is not an option. And, uh, and public interest uh, environmental group went to NAD and challenged these claims. We go to the next page, and um, this is part of uh, the sort of the presentations that uh, JBS was using, just talking about the different things that it was doing, how it's reducing emissions in its facilities. The investments it was making, you know, a billion dollars in incremental capital expenditures to reduce emissions, uh, eliminating illegal deforestation in Brazil with its cattle supply chain, JBS is um, headquartered and based in, in Brazil. If we go to the, the next page. These are things that JBS actually did. They, they entered a contract with the Carbon Trust Advisory to provide a detailed uh, plan for steps to um, reduce emissions across the JBS operations. They issued a, had a bond linked to its goals. They partnered with experts to help it reach the 2040 goal. They funded research at University of Minnesota and Colorado State. They partnered with science-based companies to develop and expand the use of feed additives to help reduce methane emissions in beef. They agreed with Royal DSM to use a uh, additive in its uh, for, for cows that will help reduce methane emissions. They had uh, funded commitments for, for soil projects. They agreed to purchase verified emission reductions, you know, essentially offsets. And they uh, committed to targets aligned with various um, environmental projects. And the NAD said, that's great, but it doesn't uh, constitute a realistic plan to get you to net zero by 2040. Um, you are making an implied, if not express, representation that the goal is not just aspirational, but feasible. And you do not have evidence that that goal is, in fact, feasible. I mean, you're doing all these things. They're great. You can talk about them. But um, the claim that you will be net zero by 2040 is, is not one you've shown as feasible, and, and therefore it is deceptive. Um, it's a you know, they really, you know, you look at what JBS was doing, they're doing all things that are, that are admirable and you would want companies to do. As with any, with a lot of the advertising claims that uh, Shaheen and I have end up having to defend, they had some, some good stuff, but they went beyond sort of the science in, in, in making those kinds of claims. And when you see that, you know, with weight loss claims, you see that with dietary supplement claims. So it's, it's sort of a, a very familiar framework. It's just here, it's in the, the green area and I think trying to substantiate that you're actually going to achieve this in you know 17 years um, is, is it, that's a really hard claim to substantiate, um, and they couldn't, and so it was found to be false. Uh, and they also appealed to the National Advertising Review Board. Um, they lost there as well. This. Um, this sort of summarizes a lot of the, the, the difficulty of this issue. Pa the panel concluded that consumers were unlikely to understand what's involved in reaching net zero. Um, consumers are likely to interpret 
if you're saying it, that it's a feasible goal and a plan is being implemented and you didn't have evidence that um, you were doing the things that were necessary to achieve that goal. So um, a pretty harsh uh, approach to these things, that approach sort of like the FTC would take, um, not necessarily the approach that uh, private plaintiffs are going to be able to take. And with that, I'll turn it over to Shaheen to start talking about uh, private litigation involving these kinds of issues. The first case that we, we have here was a case that was filed against Nick Swear. They sell underwear. The plaintiffs alleged that Nick's uh, misrepresented its underwear as sustainable, PFAS-free, fluorine-free, and tested and cleared for harmful substances. The plaintiffs then, the attorneys really, went and conducted their own testing of, the, of sample products, and they found that certain samples of the underwear contained PFAS chemicals in amounts that are detectable. And under the FTC's guides, if you're making a free of claim, uh, typically that means you don't have anything. There's not, nothing detectable in that, in, of that ingredient or that substance in your product. The FTC says that depending on context, you might be able to make a free of claim, even if a product contains a trace substance, if the level of that substance is really just background, um, something that's been acknowledged as no more of a trace contaminant or background level and the presence of it doesn't cause the harm that you would really associate with the substance, and the substance isn't intentionally added. So I anticipate that's what we're going to see, um, you know, if this litigation moves forward. But this is a good example of if you're making a free of claim or anything that could really be interpreted of a free of claim or like tested and cleared for harmful substances, you should expect that class action plaintiffs attorneys are going to go out they're going to buy that product and they're going to test it. So you can't really bypass your substantiation obligation by, let's say, going to a laboratory that has a higher, less sensitive detection limit and saying, ah, well, I passed that lab's detection, so I'm good. It, I can make a free of claim because you should expect that plaintiffs will go and they will find a lab that has a higher, that has a more sensitive testing and they might be able to say, okay, ha, we caught you. It's not actually free of. And being really careful with that if you do want to make any type of express or implied free of claim. This is a great case that I'm going to talk about here. It's a case against H&M, the fast fashion retailer. Uh, H&M had this campaign. It's Conscious Choice Campaign. And the idea behind it was that it had a line of products that it advertised as containing more sustainable materials or the most sustainable products of all of its lines. A shortcut to sustainable shopping, and you can identify their most environmentally sustainable products by looking out for their green conscious bag, um, uh, hang tags. And the court ultimately dismissed that class action complaint. And it, uh, one of the things that I thought was really interesting here was that H&M, the, the primary reason it was using um, this, so you can see recycled polyester claims here, was that it was actually using recycled PET bottles to source, its, um, to source its clothing. And a lot of companies that are looking to be more um, environmentally friendly in the clothing industry are using recycled PET bottles. And what the plaintiff said is that that's actually worse for the environment than better because PET plastic can be recycled in a bottle-to-bottle -bottle feedback loop. And that's the way that you can really reap the environmental um, benefits of PET plastic. But if you put it into clothing, then it actually has a worse, a more detrimental um, it, impact. And the, the plaintiff sort of read into this the, a general environmental friendly claim. And the court said, no, 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 H&M never made any general environmentally friendly claim. And it even said that um, it doesn't represent that its products or, are sustainable you know, generally or more sustainable than its competitors. Instead, it was very narrowly tailored to say that it was more sustainable than other H&M products. And it contained its most sustainable product, um, most sustainable line of products. And the other thing that the court looked at was that H&M um, had taken this educational approach and it had a specific web page on its website that was called the H&M sustainability page, let's be transparent. And it, it laid out what it was doing and explained a lot of the um, information behind, um, the, behind the sustainability line. And so the court looked at that, and it said that H&M disclosed on that website all the information that a plaintiff needed to determine the source, composition, and comparison of that claim. And when it was doing it, the court was dismissing this claim. It interestingly also looked at the FTC's green guides. 
And it's even cited the Green Guide's admonishment not to overstate the benefit, the environmental benefit, if that is only negligible. And so going back to that question of, well, it's PET bottles, is it really better for the environment to put PET bottles, uh, recycled PET into clothing versus putting it back into the one-to-one loop? And the court said, nope, I'm looking at the FTC guides, I'm looking at the claims, I'm looking at reasonable interpretations, I see this website that explains it, and it granted H&M's motion to dismiss. Len, do you want to talk about a couple of the other cases? Sure, uh, we'll cover these briefly, conscious of time. And th- these cases are, are um, early on, but you know, Etsy, the, the craft site, got sued this summer uh, for uh, challenging the, their carbon offset uh, claims based on the carbon emissions from shipping. Um, they filed a motion to dismiss. It's still pending, but you know this is going to be one of the cases that really tests whether um, claims of uh, carbon neutrality based on offsets are, are effective, and and also challenging the the science behind um, the benefits of some of these offsets. The again that that one motion to dismiss has been filed, but it's still not decided, and but that's a case to keep an eye on because it, you know the issues there will have ramifications broadly. The Hexclad case, that case is now in class certification. Um, you know, again, free of uh, PFAS, PFOA, and PFOA. Again, as Shaheen said, if you're making free of claims, you're really taking a a, a, a burden on it and making those claims. And um, there was no motion to dismiss filed here, you know, apparently a fact issue. So, uh, you know, this emphasizes, you know, this case is, is now claims are moving for class certification. So the, you're making those kinds of claims, you really gotta have very good science. Um, otherwise, you know, you wanna qualify those claims some so that you're not sort of sticking your neck out quite so far. Um, we go to the next one. Uh, Echosoft blankets for the, for the planet. These are the kinds of claims that the uh, FTC doesn't like in the green guides. They're also making claims of echo, 50% less water for the planet. They have filed a motion to dismiss. It has not yet been adjudicated. But again, how judges you know, being human have very different reactions to these kinds of claims. Some of them view them as puffery. Some of them view them the way the FTC does it. You're making a broad claim. If you make that broad claim, it better be truthful. Um, other judges think it's puffery. So, but you know, Having to figure that out in court, um, if you're going to make those kind of claims, you just want to make sure you understand the risk before you um, you make them. Um, so th- there's a lot of activity going on. Um, you know, recyclable claims. <laughs> this case, I thought the judge displayed re- remarkable um, common sense in the 7-Eleven case. You know, he said the recyclable claim is about the product, not about the availability of recycling facilities um, nationwide and sort of charging a marketer with having to constantly monitor the availability of recycling facilities in every community in the United States is an absurd burden to put on a marketer. Um, you know, if, if the content of your product is something that can be recycled, if the consumer does what the consumer is supposed to do with it, it's fine. If the consumer doesn't know whether or not um, something can be recycled in their community, why is that the, the, the advertiser's uh, fault? And, you know, I mean, it could be completely recycled and the guy decides to throw it in a trash can. That's not the, the advertiser's fault. So, um, but a lot of judges aren't um, being quite so um, commonsensical. Um, low carbon footprint. Um, here, uh, the the ad from Allbirds, you know, linked to you know really thorough discussions of the Hig MSI methodology and what it covered, what it didn't cover, and the, the judge sort of you know looked at everything and said you know a reasonable consumer was not going to be deceived by this. Someone who's really who was really curious and dug in would understand what the claim meant, and um, you know the life cycle assessment was was, was legitimate. They, they had a, a a reasonable basis for doing it, but the, again, the judge here, I think, you know, was uh, I think applied what I would call a common sense approach to these kinds of claims, and, and didn't impose a um, unrealistic burden on the on the marketer. 
Another area where you're seeing carbon footprint claims, uh, you know, the airlines, both in the, in the UK, the EU, and it's starting to come here. Some of the airlines have started to be sued about their claims about reducing their carbon footprint, about carbon neutrality. Um, tremendous amount of activity uh, in Europe, and it's 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 coming here on the class action front. And um, I think almost pretty soon, almost almost all the major airlines will will be involved in one way or another in, in one of those claims. So let me flip it back to Shaheen to talk about some of the state law issues that uh, are challenging marketers. This should not come as a surprise to anybody, but we've got a, a, some developments in California. The California is updating its legal standard for recyclable claims. So uh, companies will need to meet these very specific requirements if they're going to want to make a recyclability claim. To be considered recyclable, the product or its packaging will need to be made from a material type and form that is both collected for recycling by recycling programs and jurisdictions that encompass at least 60% of the state and sorted into the streams for recycling for at facilities that process and serve at least 60% of recycling programs statewide. So going back to what Len just mentioned, this idea of now before you can make a recyclable claim, it's not just about the inherent attribute of the product, but you're going to be held to the standard of whether or not they can actually, the product can actually be recycled with 60% of the state. Now, this law, um, this law by the way, um, they're currently conducting testing to see which, um, you know, what types of materials can be uh, sorted prop and collected and actually recycled at the various municipalities. So that testing is being, um, you know, it's underway by the, by the government and by the regulators. So this is something that um, the onus will be on companies to go back and look at the, the results of those tests to figure out whether or not they meet these standards. And there are some disqualifications for recyclable claims, which you can see here, things like you can't have any types of components or additives that would prevent it from being recycled. Um, you can't have intentionally added chemicals that are identified in specific regulations. You're not, you can't be made from um, plastics or fibers or P, that contain PFAS meeting um, these requirements. So again, some really technical um, uh, disqualifications here as well. And there are a couple of exceptions to those requirements that would allow you to make a recyclable claim. Um, if, for example, 75% that's sorted is actually recycled and prior to January 2030, the product or pa package is recyclable if the collection program recovers at least 60% of it. And after that, that'll be 75%. So again, a lot of technical requirements, those are on the horizon, uh, something to keep an eye out if you're making recyclable claims in California. And I mentioned earlier, California's heavy-handed stance on biodegradable claims as well. So you should not assume, by the way, that if you're just, if you're complying with the FTC's green guide, that you are necessarily in compliance with uh, environmental advertising laws nationwide. California's Voluntary Carbon Market Disclosure Act uh, was enacted in October 2023, and that's going to require detailed disclosures of methodology for tracking claims regarding net zero neutrality emissions, just like Glenn was talking about earlier. And so you're going to have to be able to conduct that methodology and then provide specific disclosures concerning that. Luckily, the um, effective date is likely going to be um, postponed uh, to 2025. Len, do you want to talk about some yep. state And action? one thing I would also note is the EU is getting even tougher on, on carbon offsets. I mean, it, it may not be possible to use them in part of your advertising soon. So um, fascinating case the New York Attorney General has brought against uh, Pepsi uh, regarding contamination in the bubble of Buffalo River. At one point, the Buffalo River was dead um, due to you know toxic waste from manufacturing. Um, the river was regenerated, all the contaminated silt was taken out, and the river was alive again. The river now, though, has a lot of plastic pollution. You can see the uh, the bottles, cans, bags that, you know, litter the river. Um, the Attorney General sued Pepsi for its role in this, and there's not any allegation that Pepsi dumped this stuff in there. Rather, Pepsi sold um, its soft drinks and Frito-Lay snacks, you know, the same way it sells them everywhere else in the world. Um, and consumers disposed of them in such a way that they ended up in the river. Um, and the attorney general and others sort of went through the junk that was in the river and figured out whose it was. 
and 17% of it was Pepsi. So the attorney general is claiming that that's Pepsi's fault, that people threw its bottles, wrappers in the river and is seeking to hold Pepsi responsible for that because um, the food packaging doesn't recycle. So how that relates to somebody throwing it in the river is not clear to me. Um, and that the um, packaging do doesn't degrade. And again, it's not clear to me, um, you know, if, if this had been thrown in a trash can, it would not have ended up in the river. But um, attorney generals don't get elected suing consumers, they get elected suing companies. Um, so that's what um, the attorney general has done here. She, she has also challenged some of the general uh, claims that uh, Pepsi made about the recyclability of its products and um, its use of plastics as, as sort of general false advertising. But on, on the, you know, the claims for the river, they filed a nuisance action and then strict liability for failure to warn that in other words, consumers didn't understand that if they threw the bottle in the river, it might um, never degrade. Um, it, I find that stunning, but no one asked me. Um, similar action uh, in Baltimore regarding cigarette butts. The city of Baltimore has sued the big tobacco companies because the number one source of litter in Baltimore city is cigarette butts. And um, they're holding their the cigarette manufacturers responsible for not making cigarette butts or you know, cigarette filters that easily uh, degrade. Again, that's a, you know, it's, tobacco companies didn't throw the butts on the street. People did. Um, not all bad news. Uh, in DC, a uh, public interest group sued Coca-Cola for um, its 100% recyclable claim about its bottles and that it was taking uh, responsibility for the environment. Those things were thrown out. And while the Court of Appeals has not yet ruled, the oral argument would indicate that they were sympathetic to Coke. Um, again, on the recyclability claim, you know, the claim wasn't false. It is 100% recyclable if it's disposed of properly. And the responsibility claims the court viewed as puffery. Um, so all's not lost. But, um, you know, if you're not marketer, having to wait to get a, a reasonable judge can be a little bit scary. All right, we're, we're running up against it. But I do want to talk about how to reduce your risk, because that's probably the most important thing. Jean, why don't you start and I'll chip in. Sure. So as we said earlier, making sure that your claims have a reasonable basis for support. Uh, if you're making a claim that needs to include um, support of not just the express claims, but also the implied claims and where technical claims are being made, make sure that you have reliable scientific evidence, get support from experts, get the testing done. As Len said earlier about third party certifications, those might be helpful, but you've got to be careful because that certification itself isn't on its own going to be uh, substantiation for the claim. And in some instances, it might expose you to even more risk, as Len pointed out, the new rule concerning endorsements and testimonials. Uh, avoiding broad uh, claims. Again, the FTC doesn't like them. Courts don't like them. If there's one thing we've seen, it's that whenever uh, a company is giving more information and qualifying its claims and giving a website, listing out all of the stuff it's doing and making it clear, we've seen that those cases tend to be a little bit more, um, you know, go better than cases where you just have broad claims and you're not qualifying them. Yeah, I mean, you might get a judge who decides it's puffery, but you might not. And, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a big risk to take, um, especially... You know, if, if you think it's going to be market share, um, you know, that you're putting that that is incremental dollars at risk if you get sued by either the private plaintiffs or or the government. Um, same thing on aspirational claims. Um, scrutinize your your claims. Think about what's the worst thing the the worst way they could be twisted because that's that's going to be the standard. That's the FTC's approach. That's a lot of judges' approaches. You know, you're responsible for all interpretations that are reasonable of your claim, even ones you didn't intend to make. Um, keep your eyes open on what's going on in the marketplace. Um, the All About Advertising Law blog is a great way to stay current. Um, the, the FTC so far in the suits it's brought has sort of gone for low-hanging fruit on recyclability claims, claim, free of claims where things weren't free. They haven't brought the big uh, carbon neutral claims yet. Whether they're going, they have the appetite for that remains to be seen. But um, the plaintiff's class action bar is just rapacious here. Um, you know, they, they, they think they kind of found the new tobacco. They, they, they are, every, they, every claim they make is the new tobacco. But um, there's, there's, some, there's some real efforts here. And the NAD has been very, very hostile. And, you know, I, most of you probably know, but if you don't comply with an NAD recommendation, they refer it to the FTC. 
And I think that if the FTC gets involved in one of these claims, it's going to be because the NAD has said you can't make this you know, carbon zero claim. And advertisers like, we think you're wrong. And then it gets referred to the FTC. And then you might have the FTC really forced with some tough decisions about whether they back up NAD or they, they decide and decide to fight with a, a, a big company over that kind of a claim. And if you're a company and you see and you're you're complying with these standards and you see that your competitors are not, then you should not be shy about bringing a national advertising division challenge because these are the types of cases that NAD is closely scrutinizing. It's taking a red pen to these claims, and so you should not feel inhibited in that regard. So I'll try and answer in like 30 seconds. A couple of questions: Has the FTC investigated any companies for net zero or carbon neutral claims? Can't really tell you what the FTC has done investigating. They haven't brought those claims yet. Have there been cases involving financial institutions and echo claims? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, there's obviously some SEC issues, but not FTC or false advertising issues. Um, the the rule about fake endorsements or fake seals um, was issued this summer by the FTC. Um, if you look on our website, our all about advertising law blog, and put in uh, fake endorsements, you'll find it. Um, intermediaries, uh, really hard question. <laughs> I'm not going to get to that one yeah, now. There, there's, um, yeah, there's a, there's a Communications Decency Act yeah, question, but I agree. That's, that's, Section it, it, 230 of the Communications it's, it's, Decency it's, Act is, yeah. yeah. Um, we can do a whole fun. webinar on that one. The CLE code is GREEN2023, GREEN2023. And we are over time, so probably should, should jump. Thank you all for attending. I hope you found this useful. And we look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.